Good evening. Uh, Craig Watkins, uh, as, was, as was noted in the introduction, a uh, visiting professor uh, here at MIT this year. My home institution is the University of Texas at Austin, so hello there. <laughs> uh, Bob Mevcat from UT Austin, or from the city of Austin. Um, and I'm also being hosted by uh, Fatini uh, Christian and, and Fox Sorrell. Uh, Fatini is a member of the political science department here, but also uh, the Institute for Data Systems and Society, which is sort of my host department uh, while I'm here this year. Um, I, you know, Fatini and I talked earlier uh, this summer about me coming here, and uh, Fatini and some of her colleagues uh, in IDSS uh, launched a, a new initiative about a year and a half ago uh, designed to sort of understand the relationship between artificial intelligence and structural racism. And it was something that we were beginning to do at the University of Texas at Austin through a campus-wide initiative grand challenge called Good Systems, where the university is basically invested in research to bring researchers from different disciplines uh, to sort of think about some of the big challenges, many of which uh, you're hearing about uh, here tonight in terms of AI machine learning uh, and its impact uh, on the world around us. Uh, many of you probably know that MIT is launching a new school of computing and one of the things that they want to do as they build this school is to make it interdisciplinary and also to design it in ways that can sort of speak to these sort of structural realities, uh, sort of systemic forms of inequality uh, that are so important. And so helping students who come through MIT, we're doing the same thing at UT Austin, develop the kind of capacity to develop the skills, the intellect, to sort of leverage these systems, leverage this technology in ways that have real world impact. And in order to do that, you have to understand uh, what's happening uh, in the world in which we live in. So these are uh, two images. Uh, you may not know these, these two gentlemen, but they were uh, both in one in 20, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, one in 2019, one in 2020, uh, were uh, falsely arrested uh, for a crime that they didn't commit, and they were falsely arrested uh, by facial recognition uh, software. Uh, the system, in some ways, uh, sort of erroneously identified them as the culprit of a crime that had been committed. They both were sort of apprehended, uh, detained, uh, and spent some time uh, in jail until the situation was, was clarified. It's, it's Circumstances like this that have sort of raised the sort of alarm around the world about the sort of importance of these technologies and the ways in which if we're not careful, they can replicate, right, the kinds of systemic forms of inequality uh, that we oftentimes hear and, and talk about. So this was something that was covered in, in the press and covered in the media, and it's created a really interesting conversation both within academia, within industry, and increasingly, right, I think, uh, around the world as well. Uh, how do we sort of respond to these systems? How do we design these systems? How do we rethink them, redesign them in ways that mitigate these kinds of disparate impacts, that mitigate the, the, the likelihood of sort of replicating uh, these forms of inequality at massive scale? Uh, and so this is something that has become uh, an important part of, of, of a conversation amongst a number of different communities, uh, clusters of, of thought leaders and thinkers, including machine learning uh, practitioners. Um, and, and over the years, uh, they have sort of developed a particular sort of framework in which they think about this issue through the notion of fairness. And that is, maybe you've heard about good AI or fair AI. This is something, right, that machine learning practitioners are trying to design. This is something that they're thinking about theoretically uh, and also thinking about the, the different and technical properties of what it means to actually build systems, to build computational systems that function and operate in fair ways. Now, many of you here are, are academics, so it probably comes as no surprise to you that something as seemingly as simple as the notion of fairness is actually quite complex. And so you have roughly 20 to 25 so different definitions and notions of fairness that have been developed or that are being developed uh, by machine learning practitioners. Just to give you sort of a, a, a glimpse of some of the kinds of conversations that they're having, if you're trying to design a model, right, and you want that model to be fair, you want that model to treat likes alike and not discriminate, not exercise bias, in the case of race, for example, do you design that model to be aware of race or do you design that model to be unaware of race? Some would argue, right, that by designing the model so that it's unaware of race, you end up, right, not recreating, right, the kinds of racial biases uh, that we've become accustomed to, right, historically and even contemporarily. But others would argue, right, the, the exact reverse. And that is, if you don't explicitly recognize race, 
you end up sort of recognizing race via proxy, right? So if, you're, if your model is looking at other kinds of data, looking at other kinds of information, zip code, school, uh, your, your financial situation, all of those things in some ways, right, can be a reflection of or a proxy of one's racial identity, class perspective. And so in that sense, the idea, right, is that even when you're not explicitly thinking about race, race implicitly makes its way into these, uh, into these systems uh, in ways that we simply uh, have to understand. One of the things that I think we're, we're, we're thinking about here at, at IDSS and certainly think about it at, at UT Austin, and it's a really interesting question, and I want to pose it to you because I think it's one of the really interesting challenges, sort of a paradoxical question in some ways, and that is, you know, can you be fair and still not engage structural racism, for example? And what I mean by that, right, is even as we think about this notion of fairness, right, treating likes alike, treating everyone equitably, right, in terms of how these models function, how they create knowledge, how they make predictions, uh, how they uh, calculate probabilities. The idea is that in, in some ways, even if we're being fair, right, we may not necessarily be dealing with the sort of deeply embedded inequalities that sort of are structured by the world in which we live in. And, and, and so this notion of fairness, in some ways, if we're not careful, makes the assumption that we all start from the same spot, right? that we all have relatively access to the same resources and same opportunities, and we know that that's simply not th the case. And so even a fair algorithm, in some ways, may not be necessarily effective or adequate enough to deal with the kinds of structural inequalities that we oftentimes hear about. Now, social scientists have spent decades, literally, sort of thinking about the ways in which racism manifests itself in many different ways. They've identified different expressions, uh, different formations, uh, different kinds of racism. And here are just three, just to give you an example. Now, interpersonal right is something that I think most of us are familiar with. There's the use of racial appetites, prejudicial attitudes. Those are things that oftentimes right are familiar to us, things that we perhaps have seen in the news media, per perhaps things that we've seen in our own sort of real world experiences. And that's something that most of us get, right? That tends to be tangible. That tends to be something that we can see something that perhaps you've experienced. But so social scientists have also thought about institutional and more structural forms of racism that tend to be less tangible, less visible, therefore much more difficult to address because they oftentimes are happening in ways that we don't even understand and happening in ways that are almost kind of on autopilot. And I'll give you an example of that here in a moment. And so think about a, a system like this, right? And, and if you think about each of these different domains, if it's the credit markets, if it's health, if it's education, these each rep represent different subsystems, different domains, different sort of institutional spheres in the world in which we live. And they each have their own different practices, their own different policies, their own different customs, behaviors, and the ways in which they function that can put some at a structural advantage and others at a structural disadvantage. And that's what we mean in some respects by this notion of institutionalized uh, racism. Structural racism, and this has become important here at MIT and in IDSS and the, and the new College of Computing and similarly at UT Austin, structural racism is something that's become more and more of a focal point of conversation and concern in society, in politics, in the tech sector, and for, for, for many years, right, uh, in academia. And it's this idea, right, that, that, that racism and, and, and forms of inequality are some ways sort of deeply baked into the very functioning and fabric of how society works and how it functions. We can think about sort of three conditions, right? Social scientists have identified in some ways sort of three conditions that make up a system of discrimination. For example, in each of these subsystems, right, does disparity or inequality exist? You can certainly look at each of these and say they absolutely do. Another example might be, right, do some of these disparities or inequalities exist precisely because of discrimination? And again, you could argue that in many of these instances, in fact, all, that is the case. But the third sort of component of the third element, right, which is really interesting and really important in terms of understanding, right, the challenge and the complexity of what we mean by structural racism. And that is, right, when disparities in one of these subsystems is sort of reciprocally linked to disparities in other subsystems. And this is, this is some, in, in some ways, right, both a, uh, a sort of theoretical interesting challenge, but if you can think about it from a computational perspective, right, and this is why we're dealing with it right within the context of AI, the context of these computational systems. In other words, how do you design a model? How do you design a computational system or algorithm that sort of addresses, right, this sort of interconnectedness, 
of these different subsystems and domains. And that's a very complex challenge. So this notion of fairness tends to treat racism or the problem of racism as primarily an individual problem, again, sort of interpersonal. But when you begin to start thinking about the institutional and the structural, you begin to see right where the computational challenges exist and how this is going to be something, or why this is going to be something that's going to require, right, sort of this interdisciplinary kind of combination of kinds of expertise that we're gathering here at MIT and certainly that we're trying to do at UT Austin as well. Let me just give you one example of what I mean by structural racism. We hear a lot about this term, particularly right as a result of the, of, of the events of the last year and a half or so. A lot of people have been trying to sort of understand this, creating reading groups, communities. Students are coming to me. Perhaps if you're a faculty member, your students are coming to you. People were cre creating reading groups all over the country and all over the world to understand what we mean by this notion of structural systemic racism as it was becoming more popular and more common as a result of some of the tragic events that have happened over the last two years or so. So take home ownership and credit markets, right? So home ownership is, 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 is a actually interesting and sort of critical aspect to quality of life, right? In some respects, right, for many Americans, home ownership is their primary pathway to wealth accumulation, but home ownership is also, right, access to education, access to uh, better health, uh, access to other kinds of resources, social networks, and things of this, this, this uh, manner. And so if you think about credit markets, right, and how they relate to each other, you don't own a home, right, without good credit. You don't own a home without access to financial resources that are made available to you uh, via the credit market. And researchers have found over the years, right, and they've, and they've been studying this for 40, 50 years or so, the kinds of discriminatory practices that are quite common, right, in the credit markets, for example. And so if we think about this as a subsystem, we think about this, right, as a particular kind of institution and the different forms and, and manifestations and expressions of discrimination that function in this way, right? The ways in which some people get steered towards subprime versus prime loans, the way in which some people get steered to lower homes in lower income communities as opposed to more middle class or higher income communities. And so in this sense, right, sort of thinking about the ways in which we might understand how this subsystem System, right, as an institution functions in ways that sort of replicates, right, inequality in a way that's quite significant. But then when you begin to think about this sort of in a sort of systemic or structural way, you begin to understand, right, the, the sort of complexity of this and why this is so profound and why it's so difficult to, to deal with this both in a political way and certainly, right, in a mathematical or, or computational way. So here, again, right, this relationship between credit markets and housing, and again, when we look at the sort of downstream effects, right, of, of, of lower income households, lower income communities, lack of access to high quality housing, the downstream effects, right, are quite significant. And this is, in fact, one of the verticals that IDSS is looking at, right, is home ownership and looking at structural racism in the credit markets and structural racism in terms of home ownership and how this is, in some ways, right, a key anchor in terms of how inequality and all of the things associated with inequality, health challenges, um, lack of access to quality schooling, lack of access to job markets and economic opportunity and mobility, all of these things become interconnected. And it's this aspect, right, the sort of structural and systemic nature of this that makes it such a vexing uh, and complex problem. Just earlier this week, I think, uh, this, this article appeared in the New York Times about a whole new generation of companies that are trying to leverage artificial intelligence to address some of these biases that have existed uh, for so long, right, in the credit markets, that have restricted people's access to quality homes, quality housing, and the kinds of opportunities and life conditions and circumstances that come along with that. But if you read this article, right, the kinds of things that these, that these sort of new sort of generation financial loaning institutions are, are operating under, how they're using artificial intelligence, right? What kinds of data are they using, right? What kinds of problems are they solving for, and how are they designing their models? And when you read this article, right, you, 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 I did at least, I left reading the articles somewhat concerned and somewhat disturbed, right? The kind of data surveillance, right, that they are now operating. This idea, right, that because so many people, or I think something like 15 to 20% of people are just locked out of, the sort of conventional 
credit market system. And so this becomes perhaps an alternative way to getting access to these resources, and yet they're being exposed and rendered vulnerable, right, to having to release literally all kinds of privacy kinds of information about their financial situations, about their banking accounts, about their lifestyles. And so in this sense, right, uh, subjecting them, right, to what I would call a, a kind of data surveillance that in some ways, right, could render them, right, particularly exposed, right, in a world in which privacy, uh, data security, and things of this nature are becoming increasingly important. Let me sort of end with, with, with a, a couple of other things here. And, and part of what we're trying to do, right, in, in, in the, the College of Computing and, and in IDSS more specifically, is sort of thinking about the future of computational systems. And how do we design them in ways that attend to these sort of structural inequalities, right? And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit it is, a, it is a difficult challenge but it is one I think that my colleagues here and my colleagues at UT Austin are committed to trying to grapple with and committed to trying to address. And oftentimes, right, we hear a lot about, you know, well, who's making these models? Who's building these systems? And we hear a lot about the pipeline, and who gets access to these resources, who gets access to the knowledge and skills to build these systems. And we know, right, that that's a, a critical aspect of this, right? We're learning, right, that the reasons that a lot of these systems are faulty the reason that you have this sort of facial recognition system sort of disaster is because of the training data sets, right, are oftentimes not representative. And so in some ways, it leads to higher error rates, right, with people with darker skin color, uh, men, uh, women of darker skin color more specifically. But there's something else that I want you to think about, right, is not only who's building AI, but also who's using AI. And so in some of the research that we've been doing, right, when we talk to uh, different sectors and different industries, like take public sector, for example, uh, those in law enforcement, uh, those in transportation, those in public health, right, to what extent have they been adequately trained to sort of be sensitive to these issues around bias and discrimination? To what extent have they been adequately trained to understand that perhaps the software that they're using, the computational systems that they're using, may not be based on a representative data set. They may be designed in some ways that lead to these unintended outcomes or unintended circumstances that lead to people being wrongly accused for crimes that they didn't commit, that leave people sort of on the margins of, of our society, even though that wasn't necessarily your intent. And nevertheless, it could happen as a result of the ways these systems function and operate. And let me leave you with this quote because I think it's really representative. I think it's a quote in some ways that summarizes the inspiration for doing this work, why I'm engaged in this work, why I think my colleagues here and at UT Austin are engaged in this work. Mr. Williams here, when he was wrongly uh, accused and arrested because of a faulty uh, recognition from facial recognition software, when he was sitting with the police officers and they showed him the picture that they used to identify him, he looked at it and he said, this obviously isn't me. Why am I here? And the police officers looked at each other and said, well, it looks like the computer got it wrong. And it turns out, right, that not only did the computer get it wrong, but those law enforcement officials got it wrong as well. And so this is the issue of how do we design these systems in ways that not only mitigate these kinds of outcomes, but how do we train the next generation of people who will be using these systems to make sure that they make decisions, right, that are ethical, responsible, and in some ways address these systemic inequalities. Thank you.